Hypnotism is a neuter. It is neither good or bad. It's like a gun. It's as good or as bad as the person that has it in its hand. As a tool, it's a marvelous medical thing, and it's going to affect medical science for years to come. But I'm not talking about the kind of hypnotism you see that Kreskin does. He says there's no such thing as hypnotism. Well, a rose by any other name will smell as sweet. I don't care what he calls it. It is still a penetration of the unconscious mind and the control of the conscious mind. It's exactly what it is. Great good or great damage. I've dealt with it in a cassette on hypnosis, medical, and occultic. In the hands of an occultist or a cultist, hypnotism is lethal. It can open the mind up to possession by demonic forces, and therefore it's very dangerous. That's my view, and I've studied it for 18 years, and I think by now I have a fairly good idea of what it can and cannot do and what it should and should not be used for. And though I am capable of using it, I do not use it myself simply because I would rather go through a school of training for this if I felt I were going to use it than even having read on it extensively attempt to play with it. And to be able to use it, you have to really get proper medical training. But don't buy the thought that a person who is really qualified and uses it is devilish or witchy or something like that. That's a lot of nonsense. How do you account for the fact that three quarters of all people on earth believe in some type of reincarnation, if not in reincarnation itself? Probably because all men have dreams. And in these dreams, they see themselves, hear themselves, and imagine themselves living before, having lived, or in different contexts than they are in at the present moment. The product of the unconscious mind, as Jung has pointed out, as other psychiatrists and psychologists have pointed out. Therefore, people, since they have these dreams, imagine and project these imaginations into reincarnation. I think that's a fairly simple explanation. Dreams account for many things in man's mind and memory. And they're common to almost all of us, three quarters of the people of the earth. Whenever we do something and know that we've been there or seen it before, you mentioned that under hypnosis, scientists have found out how that works. Well, how can you prove that what people say under hypnosis is true if under hypnosis they also proclaim reincarnation, which is false? Okay, very simply. A person who's under hypnosis and says they're reincarnated never occurs. You never get somebody saying, I am now hypnotized, I am reincarnated. They get the hypnotist making suggestions to them about their past life and they start following the leads. That's a different story altogether. So if they start talking about previous lives, under hypnosis you tell what you believe to be the truth. You may lie like a trooper under hypnosis. And you may believe that you're telling the truth. People have taken lie detector tests under hypnosis. And they've been lying through their teeth. But they thought they were telling the truth. So um, this argument isn't going to impair it one bit. Question. Yes, I wanted to ask a, a question. I'm really thinking of a particular person, and I don't know whether you want a name brought in or not. It's on a television program locally, but let me keep the name out. Do you believe that it's conclusively possible that people can cause healing in this present time? And under God, Christian people saying that people come before them and they cause healing. It is one of the first principles of the Brethren Church. <clears throat> you will forgive me. <laughs> to anoint the sick with oil and pray for them because they believe in divine healing. So do I. So anything God did 2,000 years ago, God can do today. It would be a basic error. Uh, one of the most simplistic of all theological errors to limit Almighty God. And I would be the last person in the world to say to God, you can't do it today. My question, of course, is not in reference to limiting God. I, I have understood, and maybe incorrectly, that God put these things in certain periods of time, in certain periods that this was done, and in other periods that might not be done. This is what I really was trying to... This is a theory... And it's held by people whose right to hold it I fully respect theologically. I define the theory as a beautiful idea ganged up on by a brutal bunch of facts. And uh, I disagree with the theory and they disagree with me and we love each other anyhow and we leave it there. Thank you. I've had some uh, interesting discussions with uh, a friend of mine who's into uh, 
meditation and reincarnation and all. Yeah. And you helped me out for some answers. And one thing I, I can't get around is, it doesn't seem to be able to get around, I've prayed about it, is he doesn't accept the Bible as a, as a uh, God-inspired book. It's a, a good book and that's it. And how do you, how do you meet with somebody like that? I suggest that you get hold of a book by John Warwick Montgomery, published by University Press, entitled History and Christianity. And I suggest that you read it and then give it to your friend to read. If you're going to discuss Christianity with somebody who doesn't believe the Bible, you have to establish the credentials of the Bible. You can't begin by quoting the Bible to be accused of circular reasoning, which you probably have been accused of already. There's an interesting refutation of circular reasoning, incidentally, which you might use. Say to him, the Bible is not one book, but many books written by different people spanning thousands of years. If I therefore quote one person in that long line to establish another person, I am not guilty of circular reasoning because they wrote in different time periods and they are different books. It is a controlled experiment. Almost 6,000 years of consistent testimony by people in different eras to an experience with the living God. That's a good controlled empirical verification. Start there and work up. Um, I was wondering if I could ask a, a two-part question. Uh, how would you suggest we <clears throat> share with someone who really believes in the power of the crystal ball? You know, like I'm thinking of this one person who definitely feels that she found her husband through the crystal ball. How would you suggest that we could, you know, try and I'd tell them? her to watch him close. <laughs> <laughs> that's how she found him. Look out. And it's one. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> couldn't resist that, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I think what you have to do is to ask where the crystal ball derives its power. Ask her if she seriously believes that the God of creation is involved in crystal balls. If she says yes, ask her to tell you where it says so. She won't be able to. Then you say, well, since the Bible doesn't say this and since the church doesn't teach this, it's obvious the crystal ball gets its authority from someplace else. You shouldn't be doing business with this someplace else. Whoever eats supper with the devil should have a long fork. <laughs> okay, and then I have a second part question. Um, second part. Right, okay, second part. Um, after Monday night, you know, I had invited a couple of my Mormon friends to uh, come to the session, you know, and I was a little bit disappointed because it didn't seem like anything phased them. So, you know, we were sharing with them out in the back, you know, and we used, um, um, I think it was Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you know, about the grace. and. So then he came back with a verse, you know, that uh, first in scripture that faith without works is dead. So we continued to share, you know, other grace verses, but it really didn't save him. So could you give me some other scripture to, um, to uh, try and educate him that the faith without works does not pertain to as far as salvation goes? See, he feels that, uh, sure, okay, you're saved by grace. But then, you know, if you don't do anything about it, then he thinks that there might be something more. So, you know, is there any scripture that I could... Well, the Mormons believe that you are saved by repentance, baptism, faith, and works. They do not believe in salvation by grace. No way. That's not in their theology. Bruce McConkie says, we do believe, he's speaking as a Mormon, we do believe in salvation by grace. And after all, we are saved by grace after everything is said and done. They'll tell you that. But they throw in works, baptism, repentance, the ordinances of the church, and so forth. So it's a works system. Now they have one handle they grab hold of, that's James, chapters 1 and 2, which talks about faith, if it has not works, is dead, standing alone. And they argue vigorously that a man is justified by works as well as by faith. And they'll quote you Paul in Romans 5 and James in chapter 2. Got it? Here's your answer. Remember this one because it's a goodie and it'll really work with the Mormon. Tell him, did he ever notice that in both Romans 3 and 4 and in James that Abraham is the example? Abraham is the example for Paul. Abraham is the example or the illustration for James. He'll say, well, I guess not. Or he may say, yeah, I have noticed that. You say, do you know why? And he'll have to say no, because he doesn't know why. But here's why. Paul is talking about justification before God. And he uses Abraham as an example. Abraham went up to the mountain to kill Isaac. 
And God knew before he raised the knife over the boy's chest that Abraham believed him. And he was justified by his faith. God saw his faith. It wasn't necessary for him to raise the knife. But men see the knife being raised. That's works. And they believe that Abraham has faith. So James says, don't you understand, stupid man, faith, if it does not produce visible action, is a dead faith. It stands by itself. It's alone. I'm trying to tell you, Paul is perfectly correct. Before God, men are justified by faith. God sees it in the heart. But before men, we are justified by works, not by faith. Because they see our faith through our works. Abraham is therefore justified before God on the basis of faith and before men on the basis of what? Works. Perfectly accurate brings Paul and James together and leaves the Mormons right where they were before without an argument. And then go back to Ephesians 2. Okay? Uh, you mentioned the other night part of your argument was based on the seventh chapter of uh, Hebrews, the 24th verse. And you dwelt quite a bit on the word, <coughs> excuse me, aprobatos, and you gave a definition of it. Parabatos. Uh, all right. Uh, now then, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that you said that your interpretation was that it is that that doth not pass one from another to another. Is that right? I, I quoted the greatest New Testament Greek scholar I think we ever produced, Dr. Edgar Goodspeed who translated it in his own translation, an American translation, as untransferable priesthood. And I said, if Goodspeed, who was the prince of grammarians, translated it untransferable, there had to be excellent grammatical sources for it, and I accepted his translation. That's what I said. Well, this is a quotation from Vine's Expository Dictionary, and he says, the word is used of the priesthood of Christ in Hebrews 7.24, unchangeable, unalterable, involable. RV. Was word. that uh, unalterable? And what else? Involable. Inviolable. Inviolable. Well, you know what that means. Yes. Nobody else can violate it. That's right. So it's untransferable. So it, it, that doesn't mean violate, doesn't mean untransferable. Let <laughs> of me, course. Let me finish. Of course, if somebody else can go into the priesthood, you violated it. But the priesthood is inviolate because he alone has it. That's simple. Well, let me let me finish the quotation. I just answered it for you by telling you what the word inviolate means. That's what it means. Well, let me finish the quotation, would you please? Go ahead. The RV, the AV translate it as an oh, excuse me, uh, a meaning found in the papyri. The, the more what? literal meaning in the AV and RV margin. Quote that does not pass from one to another. End quote, is not to be preferred. This active meaning is not only untenable and contrary to the constant usage of the word, but does not adequately fit with either the preceding or succeeding context. This doesn't, uh, this doesn't disturb me one bit because a vine has written a dictionary and says that the word doesn't mean that. And Goodspeed and a great many other scholars have said before Vine wrote the dictionary, and he based his work on their work, that it can mean untransferable. I translated it in accord with Goodspeed, and I'll stick with it, and a lot of other grammarians. Well, all right, it, it, you can translate any way you want, but I I'm going to stay with the good Greek scholars. Right. I, I have to disagree with Vine, that's all. All right, just to show that there is a disagreement. Then also last night you mentioned that the, all the Indians are from the Mongoloid race, is that correct? I said They're, the American Indians. Yes. All right, I have some references. Uh, you said to bring them, and if I would, and I have. I'd like to read one quotation. Do you want me to give you the references first? Where is it from? These are the references. Uh, William Howes, Mankind So Far. Uh, Kenneth McGowan, Early Man in the New World. E. A. Hooten, Apes, Men, and Morons. Nell C. Nelson, The Antiquity of Man in America in the Light of Archaeology. Is that enough? Or do you want some more? Uh, what's the paper that you're quoting from? This is an article on the, uh, 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 the Indians over here. By uh, whom? This is by uh, 
Raymond R. Broadfoot. And where was it published? In Independence, Missouri. By your church? Well, he's quoting authors that are... But by your church? Yes. Which, which is sustaining the position? Pardon? Which your church is trying to sustain the position? Well, he's just quoting these... these uh, I'm sorry. I, all... I wouldn't accept the documentation until I checked the books themselves. Just well, I'll I... let you check. I'll give you the references. Uh, uh, you give me the references afterwards. Right. I'll check them. Okay. You want me to read then? What it no, is? I'm not going to accept them until I read them. I see I'll it. check them myself. Then, then the Mormon really, Church, the Mormon Church really... here, reorganized and Utah, doesn't accept what I say till they check my references. I return the compliments. Well, that's all right. I'm not. I don't care whether you accept it or not. What I'm concerned about is and I, uh, I've the answered the question. I've answered the question. I'll check the references. Thank you. Okay. You want to know the truth, huh? Oh yes, yes, yeah. I have found the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said. That's it. Each Christmas season at the Griffith Park Planetarium, they have a, a Christmas show in which uh, they read the birth of Christ in, the, in Matthew, and then they go back in time. And according to the Griffith Park Observatory, there was a conjunction, I believe is the name, of three planets in the constellation of Pisces, which to the ancients, I think, stood for the house of Hebrew. And they dated this approximately 4 to 8 BC. Are you aware of this? And yes. is this scientifically valid? Yes, it is. And that's probably the date of the birth of Jesus Christ. Because also, um, it's been pointed out by astrologers that being in the constellation Pisces in the sign of the fish, the Greek word for fish is ichthus, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Uh, I personally don't care what sign it's under. I do believe the configuration took place, <coughs> and uh, that's probably valid. Jesus was probably born somewhere between 4 and 8 B.C. Do you believe that these are the stars that the wise men followed? Probably. I don't know. Nobody else does either. Let's quit while we're ahead. You made the statement that there were more than one forgivable sin. Unforgivable. Un pardon me. <laughs> I'd like you to comment on that, please. Because you, yeah. you stated two of them, that you didn't... You said there was a third one that you got... Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Rejection of Jesus Christ, dying in that rejection. That's the second. The third one is mentioned by John in his first epistle. He says there is a sin that ends in death, but I'm not discussing that. So there's, I said, possibly a third or probably a third, but it's not mentioned by name. I see. Do you have an idea what that... you say that third one again, please? I'm, I'm just quoting John. There is a sin that ends in death. Okay. Okay. Now, there's another one in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It was a man who was living in immorality. Open immorality with his father's wife. And Paul says, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the body that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Which meant that if he didn't give up the practice he was in, Satan would be permitted to destroy him. That his spirit might be saved. He would not be forgiven. He'd be destroyed so that his soul wouldn't be uh, lost. So there are a number of references that could be meaningful. Before I depart, I would like to take just a moment to say something to you all. First, to thank you for being here and for praying for these meetings because it's obvious that the Holy Spirit has blessed them. Secondly, if the meetings have been a blessing to you, continue in prayer for this ministry and for me. I'm glad that you've been here and that we've had a chance to share together. Remember Christian Research Institute in prayer if you'd like to help us. Remember how you can do it. Thank you.